Good morning or afternoon, actually. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm director of education at the National First Ladies Library, located at the National or at the First Ladies National Historic Site in Canton, Ohio, where we partner with the National Park Service to bring you exhibitions, research, and programming related to the First Ladies of the United States. Before we get started today, I want to introduce you to our new president and CEO of the National First Ladies Library, Patty Dowd Schmidt. Patty will tell you about some of the exciting things we have in the works here at National First Ladies Library. Welcome, Patty. Good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon, I guess I should say. Yes. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, there are over 400 of you who signed up to be on this webinar, which is just amazing. And um, hoping that you know so many of you will just really keep doing these programs they're just so well done um i've been here in this position now as ceo for honestly just over three weeks and i've just been so impressed with everything that allison has been able to put together with our lectures so very much looking forward to having all of you share in this legacy lecture with bill coon who has written a wonderful book um, about reading reading Jackie, her autobiogra autobiography and books. Um, he's going to provide you with a really wonderful talk here in a moment. Um, but I also wanted to let you know that for the entire next month and, and also throughout the rest of the year until next April, we're going to be celebrating Jackie Kennedy at the National First Ladies Library. We have a special exhibit starting on May 2nd, open to the public at the First Ladies Library in Canton. And we're doing some special events around that, including a VIP reception the night before to give everyone a first look. Um, I was just curious of how many of you might have already been to the First Ladies Library in Canton. Um, so if you have been, could you put that in the comments for us and let us know if you've come and if you've enjoyed your visit. Um, so we have many other programs coming up, uh, not only honoring Jackie, but but other wonderful things that Allison has put together, which you can find on our actually all new website that we have recently revamped. So if you go to firstladies.org backslash programs, all of Allison's amazing programs are on there and you can sign up for them in the coming months. And then lastly, I would just encourage all of you, if you do have a chance to go on our website and, and take a look around, if you have a chance and would like to make a donation to help us support these programs that we do, that would be much appreciated. We really do appreciate all of you being here and participating with us and all the hard work that goes into these programs. And, and we couldn't do it without you, the folks that really enjoy them and are engaged. So thank you. And I hope to see you back at some of these programs in the future. Thank you so much, Patty. And again, we're so happy to have Patty at the site now. And we do want to encourage people to come and visit the National First Ladies Library um, and check out our exhibitions. Uh, and I always love connecting with people who attend our programs. So this spring, we will have a number of great programs. Um, you can visit us in person to see Beyond Camelot, but we'll also continue to have ways for you to connect virtually. Next month's Legacy Lecture will feature Kimberly, Kimberly Chrisman Campbell, um, who will speak about her book, Red, White, and Blue on the Runway, about the only fashion show to ever take place at the White House in 1968. Uh, that talk will take place at, on May 3rd, right here on Zoom. Um, in addition, this month's talk with a curator will be joined by a special guest, Ashley Callahan, who will speak on scarf designer Frankie Welch and her connection to the First Ladies. You can check out all of those programs, as Patty mentioned, at our new website, firstladies.org, um, as well as some of our ongoing programs, like our film discussion, First Ladies on the Page book club, and Cooking with the First Ladies, um, which will be coming up soon, and um, Mamie Eisenhower theme. So as for housekeeping, I'd like to encourage you to use the chat and let us know, again, where you're tuning in from, um, what kinds of programs and activities you're interested in. Um, and uh, also, if you have questions for the speaker, we encourage you to use the Q&A and we will moderate um, a question answer at the end of today's talk. Um, if you're having issues with Zoom and you are logged in through Eventbrite, we encourage you to click out into the Zoom app or into Zoom online to get the best broadcast experience. And then lastly, this talk will be available to registrants afterwards, and that info will be shared via a follow-up email. 
Um, last but not least, we're super excited to kick off this year of Jackie Kennedy Onassis related programs and our wonderful exhibition with today's talk, Reading Jackie. So let me briefly tell you about today's speaker before I hand the reins over to him. William Kahn is the author of several books, including works of history, biography, and fiction. His biographies include works on the British Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli, Jacqueline Onassis, of course, and Queen Victoria's Chief of Staff and his wife, Henry and Mary Ponsby. His novel, Mrs. Queen Takes the Train, is about an unplanned foray into the late that the late queen made beyond Buckingham Palace. So please welcome William Kahn. Thanks so much for joining us, and I'm going to turn things over to him. Well, thank you very much for that, um, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to uh, share my uh, screen with you and hopefully show you my um my slideshow uh so let me just um let me just do that <clears throat> okay um there's my book reading jackie her autobiography and books um and let me just begin with a question to you. I know I'm not actually physically in contact with you, but I'd like you to think about something. You're invited over to somebody's house for the first time. Um, you don't know them very well, and your host leaves you in the living room uh, with the bookshelf while they go and get you a glass of wine or a cup of tea or something. Um, what do you do? Well, if you're somebody like me, you secretly sidle up to the bookshelf to see what kind of books people are reading um, in order to get some kind of hint uh, at their personality. And um, the idea behind that anecdote is the idea behind my book, that you can tell something uh, special about Jackie uh, by looking at the books, the hundred books she did as an editor, uh, first at Viking and then at Doubleday during the last 20 years of her life. A hundred books is a pretty good record of achievement uh, during these, these 20 years from about 1975 to 1994. And if you look carefully at the books, you can see things about her personality, about uh, her life, reflections on her on herself, through the work she chose to do, through the books she chose to edit. She had a great deal more power to choose than most editors did. So what she chose to work on uh, is revealing of who she is as a person. And that's the main idea um, behind, um, behind my, my book. She almost never gave interviews. She locked up her papers for 50 years after her death. Uh, she asked her children in her will not to have her letters published, but she revealed things about herself in these books that I think are fascinating insights into her character and personality. So first of all, something you might know not know about, uh, about Jackie, um, she had a notion of herself as a reader, as somebody who was happiest at home uh, reading a book. This was uh, a pencil sketch which Aaron Schickler did as a study for uh, Jackie's official White House portrait, obviously prepared in the 60s after JFK had already died. And this was not the sketch that they chose um, to be made into a painting for the White House itself, but this was one that Jackie said, I'd like to keep that one. I'd like to buy that sketch. Um, so the sketch she chose of herself was on a sofa reading her book. And this kind of corresponds to something that her friend Nancy Tuckerman uh, told me. Nancy was probably my best source for this book. She had been, uh, not only at Miss Porter's school with Jackie, but also at the White House and later at Olympic Airlines. She was with Jackie all the way up until she died. 
And Nancy told me most people thought she was out jet setting around and being a socialite. But in fact, most of the time, if you wanted to find her, you could find her on her sofa reading a book. Um, in the period after um, Onassis died in 1975, she, she was married to Aristotle Onassis from 1968 to 1975. In that period, she started to look around uh, for some work to do. Onassis, being a typical Mediterranean man, had said, I don't want any wife of mine working. So Jackie, no, you cannot get a job. But after he died, she was free to do what she wanted. And she approached her friend, Tom Ginsburg, whose family owned the Viking press and told him that um, she'd be interested in exploring with him the possibility of coming and working at Viking. So in 1975, she was appointed a consultant editor uh, at Viking. She was in her 40s. She didn't have any experience. But Ginsburg's view was, hey, this is great PR for the company, and she can, um, she can learn on the job. We'll give her assistance that um, help her figure out how, how to be uh, an editor. She was at Viking for just under three years, from 1975 to 1978. There was a kind of a scandal at the end of uh, that period, and so she had to leave Viking. I'll go into that more if you want to during the Q&A. But she had to leave Viking at the end of 77. She went to join Doubleday, another major publisher, and she was there for 16 years. And she was much happier there. She was there until the day she died in 1994. Okay. Um, I think what I've done, this somehow, this, this slide isn't exactly where I expected it to do, to do but um, this is good. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through the hundred books she did as an editor, and I'm going to group some of the prominent uh, books that she did into several subheadings or themes which reflect on her life. And one of the things which was clearly an important, an important part of her identity uh, was motherhood. Um, she raised John Jr., she raised Caroline, uh, from infancy, she was very proud of her role as a mother. She asked uh, Schickler to do a sketch of them. And I think it's probably not a mistake that she has John reading a book and she's got Caroline either writing in a book or perhaps sketching in a book. The two kinds of uh, activities which were um, close to their mother's heart as, uh, as well. But you can also sort of see the extent to which motherhood was important in her choice of books that had to do with um, childhood during her career. She did quite a few books for children, including uh, four books with Carly Simon and one book with Peter Cease, who was later um, uh, awarded a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant and thought that that very prestigious fellowship really um, got its start from Jackie recognizing his talent as an artist. She, they did two books together on Prague uh, in the period uh, after the Velvet Revolution. Um, and the, the, the Prague book is called The Three Golden Keys. In addition to books, um, meant for children, she also had a kind of a, a mothering quality as an editor. Two of her, um, her authors came to me and specifically when I interviewed them told me that Jackie had had a very strong maternal um, quality when she was shepherding their books through the press. Louis Auchincloss and Elizabeth Crook, both of whom wrote books for Jackie, thought that Jackie kind of turned into their mother when they were going through this very daunting editorial process. She also had younger colleagues who she worked with 
at uh, Doubleday, including Scott Moyers, who's now a, a very distinguished editor himself. But uh, when he worked for Jackie, he was just a kid in his 20s. Um, she would, he told me, give him a hard time for um, coming out in the cold and his wet hair. And when he came down with a, a bad cold, she brought him in some Theraflu to the office. Um, she also sponsored him uh, in a marathon where he was raising money uh, for leukemia from which his own mother had died. So not only did her own, a, a significant section of her own books arise for her, from her own experience as a mother, but her colleagues and authors both detected a very strong maternal strain in her as well. Remember the ladies, women in America, 1750 to 1815. This was one of Jackie's first books at Viking. It was a book which celebrated um, the contributions of women to American history uh, in the revolutionary era. It came out timed uh, to coincide with the bicentennial in 1976. And it kind of confirms what Betty Friedan said about, uh, about Jackie. Betty Friedan uh, was an early feminist who wrote The Feminine Mystique in 1963, the same year that uh, JFK died. And Betty Friedan went on the record to say, Jackie was a closet feminist. She may not have marched out in the streets for the Equal Rights Amendment, but women's issues, and especially the role of independent women trying to make their way in a men's world, comes up over and over again in her books. So there's not only Remember the Ladies, an early work of women's history in, in America, but she commissioned a, a novel called Call the Darkness Light about mill workers, female mill workers in Lowell, Massachusetts. She commissioned a number of book about, books about women in the 18th century. Uh, and she asked a man from Chicago, a former priest who left the priesthood, to write about a book about Jane Byrne, who was the first female uh, mayor of Chicago, which was called Queen Bee. So, this is another theme of her books, books about women in history, books about significant women in politics, books about women, female mill workers in Lowell, Massachusetts. She really cared about this long before it was fashionable. Nowadays in history, women's uh, history is very much an established part of the academic world. But when Jackie was doing in this in the 80s and the 90s, she was really ahead of her time. She also gave a rare, very rare interview to Gloria Steinem, who was the founding editor of Ms. Magazine. And this was in connection with promoting her book on the female mill workers, or rather the book that she'd edited, uh, which, was on a, which was by a woman from Massachusetts. And she says, Jackie says explicitly in this interview with um, uh, Gloria Steinem, something I'd like to read for you. This is Jackie speaking. What has been sad for many women of my generation is that they weren't supposed to work if they had families. There they were with the highest education and what were they supposed to do when the children were grown? Uh, watch the raindrops coming down the window pane leave their fine minds under exercised of course women should women should work if they want to so here's a side of jackie's editorial work that shows us that jackie was not who you you might think she was yes she was in those beautiful clothes yes she was on the yacht yes you'd see her uh, at parties but she was also producing these books on women's experience in the world. And that strikes me as highly admirable. She also did a large number of books on photography. Um, so this is one of the kind of the ironies of her situation. She was the most photographed woman in the world. And here she was uh, specializing in books of photography, books on photography. 
And one of the most famous uh, books she did um, was composed mainly of photographs chosen by Diana Vreeland. And that's Diana Vreeland up on the top picture with Jackie at the Institute of Contemporary Photography. Diana Vreeland was, of course, a very famous editor of Vogue. And she was trying to define with these photographs what makes up a woman's allure. And the book was called Allure. And two of the women who she wanted to feature, that Diana Vreeland wanted to feature in Jackie's book, were Marilyn Monroe and Maria Callas. Now, of course, there's the rumor out there in tabloid land that JFK had had an affair with Marilyn Monroe, that Onassis, even when he was married to Jackie, had kind of uh, started up his relationship with Mar Maria Callas again. Jackie had her own personal reasons not to be thrilled about these two women. But in the case of Diana Vreeland's book, she said, yes, those two women were knockouts. We have to feature them. And it's as if she was able to rise above her own personal history, her own personal sadnesses, her own personal grievances with these women to feature them in Diana Vreeland's book. And that's another reason why I admire Jackie's work as an editor. Another example of that is a book of photography she did with William Eggleston um, called The Democratic Forest. Now, Eggleston was um, famous in the world of art photography. He was one of the first people who moved art photography from black and white to color images. And he did this book with Doubleday with Jackie as his editor. What's surprising here is similar on the book that he that she did with Diana Vreeland, which is that Eggleston featured a, a photograph of the building in Dallas from which Lee Harvey Oswald had actually taken aim at JFK in 1963. And rather than shy away from it, Jackie didn't flinch. She said, no, it's got to go, go ahead just as he planned it. Um, he's, a, he's an artist. He's an artist of some standing. I'm not going to let my personal tragedy, and indeed the nation's tragedy, um, uh, get in the way of what this artist wants to feature in this book. Um, so it went ahead just as Eggleston planned it um, with the, the shot uh, from Dallas in the book. She worked with another photographer, Marc Ribou, who was a Frenchman, who um, took uh, pictures of a mountain in China, uh, which was frequently a hiking destination for newlywed Chinese couples. And they were both, Jackie went to go and meet Ribou in uh, China as he was working on this book. And they were both shocked that nobody recognized Jackie in China. So they went in to a kind of a cheap photographer's hut um, who was there at the base of the mountain it might have been at the base of the mountain or it might have been in Beijing, I'm not sure which, but they had their photographs done uh, in China. And um, it was their kind of sly joke because the photographer, the photographer didn't know who either of them were. So Ribou got the photograph in Paris and clearly the photography had kind of, photographer had kind of hand painted these colors on with kind of garish pink in Jackie's cheeks. And Ribou brought it with him to New York and at a dinner party at Jackie's apartment on Fifth Avenue, he said, Jackie, I have the picture of your wedding with me. <laughs> Voila. And was able to um, create uh, a lot of laughter and big joke at the party. Um, so that was nice. Uh, the last book of photography that I want to talk about is uh, an elegant book on Tony Frisell, a photographer who was a, a fashion photographer, for, for, but also a photojournalist who did um, other kind of news issues in her photography as well. And um, it's interesting that Tony Frisell, who was born into some privilege, sort of as Jackie was herself, 
was somebody who was able to kind of transform her life to get out of the world into which she was born through her work. And the jacket copy on, on Frisell's book which it's very possible that um, Jackie would have written herself. And if she didn't write it herself, she would have had um, the ability to approve it. Says this, Purcell stretched the boundaries of the privileged world into which she was born and became one of the most innovative and renowned photographers of her time. So what the jacket copy is saying is her photographs, Frisell's photographs were her autobiography. The pictures her were, the pictures she took, the work she did were her life. And I think the same can be, can be said of what Jackie did with her books. She stretched the boundaries of the privileged world into which she was born. And that's what Jackie was doing with these books as well. This is a picture of a model that Frisell dropped into the dolphin tank at Marine World in Florida. And I think Jackie left something important out of this book, which is don't try this at home yourself, ladies. <laughs> I mean, it looks great here, but I'm not sure you'd be able to recapture it if you tried to do it on your own. Frisell also knew a very privileged world. This is a picture of the Vanderbilts having tea uh, in Florida. That's a very famous, the kind of older lady on the right-hand side is Consuelo, who was a very famous Duchess of Marlborough. So Frisell did take some pictures, which are reflected in the book, of how very rich people lived. Um, and I don't know about um, what it's like at your house, but when you come for tea with Bill Kuhn at my house, it looks exactly like this. That was a joke. She also took pictures of the Tuskegee Airmen, Tony Frisell did during the Second World War. They were an all black regiment of the Air Force when the Air Force was segregated. And so Frisell was really somebody who was conscious of, uh, of racial injustice and, um, and issues surrounding poverty as well. When the book came out, Tony Frisell was already dead. Um, so Jackie was selecting the pictures herself along with Tony Frisell's daughter, uh, who was called Sydney Frisell Stafford from Tony Frisell's photographs at the Library of Congress. So this is Sydney Frisell Stafford on the right hand side with a curator in the stripes from the Library of Congress. And they're actually going through the photographs um, in the Frisell collection at the Library of Congress. So, you know, Jackie wasn't just a privileged woman who sat at home and let her assistants do the job. She actually flew to various places that she needed to go to help select herself, select pictures herself and meet authors um, whose books she wanted to sponsor. It's interesting to me that she's got these big kind of um, black glasses in that Library of Congress uh, picture that make her look um, somewhat workmanlike and uh, a little bit goofy. And I think that's the real Jackie. That's Jackie on the job. I need my glasses to see properly. That's not the Jackie um, who's smiling for the photographers. Uh, Tony Frisell photographed Jackie's wedding to JFK in 1953. Um, she didn't like it, Jackie didn't, when her fame was referred to. She didn't like to talk about that. And the Doubleday staffers who I talked to were a little uncomfortable when they got to the end of the Frisell boxes and said, Jackie, we think you should um, have a picture of your wedding to JFK, which Tony Frisell took. And Jackie sort of said, okay, let's just take that one. <laughs> um, so she wasn't vain. She wasn't um, interested in talking or considering her fame or getting the best shot that she looked the best. Um, she just chose it pretty quickly at the end of a long day at the Library of Congress in, in Washington. 
What interests me really about this book about Tony Frisell is that there's a certain elegance to these images and there's an elegance to the production of the book with the images in them. And I think those, that visual elegance is the counterpart or the corollary or the, the necessary um, element of Jackie's um, personality that is an eye for elegance uh, that, went, uh, that went into who she was. Um, beautiful photographs, beautiful buildings in New York, um, kind of an elegant self-presentation. These were all part of who Jackie was. She did quite a few books on uh, photography. Um, excuse me, not photography. We just finished photography. Quite a few books on ballet. Um, uh, she did a book of memoirs by Martha Graham and Judith Jamison, two premier choreographers and dancers on the American scene in the 20th century. She also did uh, memories of the choreographer George Balanchine. And she commissioned Nureyev, the, the uh, Rudolf Nureyev, who's there in the center of that picture with Caroline, uh, to write an introduction to a collection of Pushkin's fairy tales. So dance was very important to her, but this wasn't just about loving beautiful things. She actually took a risk with Nureyev. Nureyev was openly gay and um, he, came under attack when he was in his 40s, when people started saying that he was too old to be dancing and uh, that there was something unmanly about him. Well, Jackie very rarely spoke up to the New York Times in defense of Nureyev and said that people used to think ballet dancing was unmanly, but now people come from 50 states to see him. Those are Jackie's words. Um, so she stood up for him and defended him at a, a, at a sort of a, a, a vulnerable period at, uh, in his career. Um, she also uh, put together um, the book of Martha Graham's memoirs after Martha Graham actually died. The actual text was mainly written before Martha Graham died, but um, the pictures uh, came together for the book which Jackie was working on after Martha Graham died. And there are oftentimes some kind of covert and almost whimsical um, references to sexuality in these books on ballet. Um, and this is a photograph of Martha Graham herself um, uh, from the book Blood Memory, which Jackie would almost certainly have selected and the caption reads in part, where did you come from? I could eat you up. And Martha Graham seems to be addressing this to the man's bottom. Um, so there's an, an, Amer an element of the erotic in, in these books. And Graham goes out of her, her way in her memoir to say that she'd shocked senators in Washington who were worried that her dancing was provocative and immoral. Sex is for pleasure, Martha Graham said, not for procreation. <laughs> and it's just funny that Jackie was endorsing that by bringing out this book. Uh, quite a few of Jackie's books um, were on royal subjects. This is a picture of Jackie with the, the late queen with JFK during his, uh, during his presidency. She was often informally known as America's Queen. But with these books, she really um, took on the subject of royalty and history as a subject uh, which animates the history of art. And I, I just thought that it was interesting to discover that uh, Jackie did so many royal books. She did books on the Napoleonic court in France, on the 18th century court in Versailles. Um, and she also did a book with Princess Grace uh, in which they uh, featured 
Madame de Pompadour, who was the most famous patron of the arts in the 18th century. So this is a book about flowers and about flowers in this, this fantastic dress, uh, which uh, Princess Grace was doing. But the fact that they chose Madame de Pompadour for a prominent place in the book, and Madame de Pompadour has got a book on her lap, is not a mistake, I would say. That's, that's, that's what Jackie was interested in. And Jackie was herself, of course, an important patron of the arts as the First Lady, bringing um, Nobel Prize winners and the famous, uh, famous musicians like Pablo Casals to the White House, as well as, I believe, the Joffrey Ballet and some other important groups. Jackie also did um, some work on the Russian monarchy. She went with the head of the Met, uh, Tom Hoving, to Russia in the 1970s to choose some dresses to that were going to be loaned to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York for an exhibition there. And while they were in the basement of one of the archives in Russia, they came across a swan's down opera cape last worn by Alexandra, who was the last Tsarina of Russia. Um, she was, of course, later uh, assassinated with her husband and her children after the Bolshevik Revolution. But Jackie uh, told Tom Hoving, you know, I'll try that on. <laughs> I'll try on the Tsarina's opera cape. So he, this is a little tourist snapshot of Jackie and the Tsarina's uh, uh, in the Tsarina's outfit with a little bit of a uh, smile to show, yes, <laughs> I'm interested in regal figures. I love the clothes and uh, I haven't been so far from that in my own life. Um, so I, I, like, I like that photograph for that reason. One of her best sellers um, among the royal books was a book called The Last of Tsar which she wrote with Edvard Rajinsky, that's Rajinsky over there on the right, which was about the murder of the Tsar and his family uh, after the Bolshevik Revolution. This is at the launch party for the book um, in the Russian Tea Room in New York. I met and I interviewed Rajinsky for my book and he's a talker. It's hard to get a word in edgewise when you're talking to him. And you can see that on Jackie's face. She's sort of like, how am I ever going to <laughs> how am I ever going to get away from this conversation? She seems to be saying with those eyebrows. But she looks like a million dollars in that little harlequin dress. Um, she looks fantastic. <laughs> now there's a, there's a, some groups of Jackie's books that are more admirable than others. She did a whole group of books with Tiffany and Company. And this is John Loring, um, who was the design director uh, of Tiffany and Company. She did a series of books that were very profitable, both for Tiffany and for Doubleday. Um, one is called Tiffany Taste, one is Tiffany History, one is Tiffany Parties, one is Tiffany Wedding, and one is Tiffany Cookbook. This is not high art. Um, this is not serious scholarship or serious history. These are gorgeous photographs of things which are on sale in the shop. So Jackie was essentially producing a very commercial catalog for a very commercial store. Uh, her name wasn't on the book, on the books, but she was essentially working on these uh, to help improve the Doubleday bottom line. And John Loring was doing the same thing for Tiffany and Company. So Jackie's no saint. This is these are not the most admirable of her books, although you know it's gorgeous photography. And slyly, she and Loring um, uh, inserted into the book called Tiffany Wedding um, a picture of Hammersmith Farm, which, which is the Auchincloss property in Newport, from which Jackie had herself been married in 1953 to JFK. And there they are selling a little sapphire a sapphire ring. Now, nobody knew that Jackie was the editor of this book. Um, so 
this is just a kind of a sly joke between uh, Loring and Jackie. It's a little bit like Alfred Hitchcock walking onto the set of one of his movies as a kind of a standby. And if you don't know that that's Hitchcock, who's the director of the movie, then you're kind of out in the cold. Similarly, you've got to, you've got to know that this Tiffany, Tiffany wedding book was edited by Jackie in conjunction with John Loring. And that's the house from which she was married herself. Um, a, a, a sort of a next to last group of her books, and I'm, I'm getting toward, toward the end um, now, was with people that she knew from the White House, politicians mainly whom she knew from the White House. Stuart Udall was um, Secretary of the Interior under JFK and LBJ. He wrote Jackie out of the blue after many years of not speaking to her, saying he wanted to do a book on the role of the conquistadors in early American history. He said, the British, the French, they get too much attention about the origins of the country. I want to do something about the Spanish origins of the country. And he persuaded her and her friend Maurice Templesman to come out to Arizona um, to uh, see, the, see the trail of the conquistadors and uh, she produced a book with him, um, which is one of these Camelot books connected to, the, to her time in, in the White House. A much more weird book is this one. Alani Tarasuk was uh, a man who was curator of arms and armor at um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, who Jackie knew personally. And a man came to her out of the blue, his name was Philip, Me Philip Myers and said, Lanny Tarasuk is not just uh, an art curator. He was a spy who worked for the Americans and uh, worked against the Russians. And he was murdered in France. And I think the Russians were up to it and I wanna tell his story. So I have a couple of voicemails now which Jackie left on Lanny Tarasuk, excuse me, which left, she left on Philip Myers's uh, voicemail when she first got the proposal for this book. So take a listen right now and listen to Jackie's voice. Uh, Mr. Myers, it's Jacqueline Onassis in New York on Wednesday morning, January 8th at 11.10. If you could call me at the mornings are best for me, but uh, I'm fascinated by your what you sent me, and I'd love to talk about it. Bye. So that's the real Jackie. That's Jackie toward the end of her life as a working editor who's all business and who's working on this uh, proposal that she's gotten from a man she didn't know. Mr. Myers, it's Jacqueline Onassis. I'm home this evening in New York, Tuesday. The number is 212-628-2403. Could you call me? Thanks. Bye. Okay. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A if you'd like me to, because it's an interesting story. Um, last of all, she did a group of books on fame the most famous woman in the world, it's interesting to me, did a definite grouping of books about celebrity and about how celebrity and fame can be a burden for the people who inherit it, but who can also um, influence people's lives for good. And she did one of her most successful books with Bill Moyers, that's Bill Moyers with Maurice Templesman and Jackie, um, and <clears throat> this book with Bill Moyers is called The Power of Myth. And it's about how ordinary people can be transformed overnight into mythological figures as Jackie herself was. So I think this is the strongest evidence that there is that she was considering her own life when she was commissioning books. These have all been great pictures, mainly of, uh, of Jackie and the books that she did. But if you really want to know 
what this woman is like, I think you've got to take a look at um, some of the books she edited. And The Power of Myth would be, a, would be a great place to start, but there are also a whole list of the hundred books she edited at the back of my book called Reading Jackie. Um, I've also done very recently a short book called Jackie Stories, Eight Friends of Jacqueline Onassis. Um, I revisited my interviews um, for the first book, and I went back and tried to describe a little bit about what it was like to sit down with eight of Jackie's friends. And uh, this is my, my very short book about that, recollecting those interviews. And uh, if you want a shorter intro uh, to Jackie and her books, uh, this, is the, this is the way into it. Okay, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm coming back uh, uh, into um, the larger presentation and I'd love to hear if anybody's got, got questions. Sure. <clears throat> I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about, you talked about her life as an editor, but how her earlier life as a first lady um, may have influenced her life as an editor. I'm thinking about uh, any feedback that she might have given her husband on Profiles in Courage, um, as well as curating and editing the White House Guide. Yeah, she had a she had a big role. She had a big role in that in that White House guide. And if you look at her papers in the Kennedy Library, it's clear that um, she was personally involved in um, collecting the history of the furnishing she'd acquired from the White House redesign. And interestingly, um, she also wanted for the first time, the White House to have its own collection of books. So she set aside in the 1960s um, a library, uh, which would be a permanent kind of collection of books that would stay there um, independent of different presidents. So, I mean, I think that just shows that, you know, she cared about books, she cared about history, and she cared about the ongoing life of the um, of the house beyond the time that um, that she'd been she'd been there. As for um, profiles and courage, I don't know very much about it. I think it's dedicated to her, isn't it? Uh, do you know that, Allison? I'm not sure. Yeah, I believe so. And I've I've heard um, our director of research here thought that she had some some role in assisting him behind the scenes and giving I, him that. I wouldn't be surprised at that because it seems to me that there. Are, you know, there, there are many biographies of people who've, you know, who've had kind of uh, courageous things that they've done. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if she wasn't involved in the research for that. That's a good question. One, actually, one of the major questions that keeps coming up here in our Q&A section is, of course, um, the, the change in publishing houses and the scandal behind that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes. Uh, so um, Jeffrey Archer was a kind of a, a British politician and also a best-selling author of British thrillers. And he wrote a thriller uh, with a, a thinly disguised main character, which was about Ted Kennedy. And the character gets assassinated in the, in the book. And although Jackie didn't, didn't have anything to do with editing um, the book, there was a big kind of scandal afterwards that the publishing house that she was working for should have actually officially published um, this book. And uh, the review in the New York Times um, says, it doesn't mention her name, but it points to her specifically. It says, anyone who was involved in this book should be ashamed of herself. So at that point, she resigned. Um, and um, there's been some dispute afterwards about how much she knew about it in advance. Ginsburg told another author that um, he had totally warned her about this in advance, that it might cause a scandal. Um, she later claimed that she didn't know about it in, in, in advance. 
whatever the the thing is um she didn't edit her edit it herself but the company she was working for brought it out and it, it is a pretty bad book it's it's trash but it sells that was a, another question we had so <clears throat> how often um I'm wondering about the sales of the books that uh, she edited was we mentioned when you mentioned the Tiffany book, her name wasn't associated, although there were hints that she was involved. Um, was there marketing involved in some of these books that promoted Jackie as an editor? I keep thinking now about um, especially first daughters like Jenna Bush, who have their name front and center to sell books as part of book club promotions. Um, how how pivotal was she in the marketing of the books and how well did the books that she edited sell? She tried as much as she could to keep her name out of the books. And she, um, she said, I, the person who should be front and center here is the author and I sh I'm remaining behind the scenes. There were some where she could not escape some publicity. Um, she was kind of, they kind of, there was a kind of a quid pro quo um, at Doubleday. If you want to do some of the small circulation art books that you like to do, which don't make very much money, then occasionally you've got to do some books for us that do make money. So the Doubleday books on Tiffany were one of those. I wrote, the, there are five of those books. But the, there's another one um, with Michael Jackson called Moonwalk. And there was a picture of the two of them together, uh, which was circulated um, uh, when the book was published. And Michael Jackson himself said, I'm not gonna do this book unless Jackie is my editor. So if Doubleday, if Doubleday was gonna sign him, they needed to provide her, um, provide her as the editor. Um, but uh, for the most part, her name is not in the book. Um, her names are not in the books. Um, occasionally, um, somebody thanks her in an acknowledgments, but in the acknowledgments, but for the most part, she's pretty absent. She's pr pretty behind the scenes in most of these books. I wanted to ask you too about specifically that Michael Jackson book, because it seemed like it was something that she did not want to be involved in um, and shied away from, but she was forced into it. Can you talk about her ability to choose versus books that she was kind of assigned to pursue? Yeah, um, so um, the editors that doubled, there were several different processes in place during the, the period um, when she was there. And at first, there was a kind of a big committee which was composed of other editors and the sales department and an editor would have to go and pitch the her book to that to that group and the group would have to agree that yes we think that's a good um that's a good process and she did she did participate in that a little bit um toward the end uh she was um pitching her books to the head of Doubleday himself a man by the name of Steve Rubin and he told me sometimes I would have to tell her that that is not going to sell enough copies Jackie for us to be able to recoup uh, the money on the paper and the distribution and he discouraged her from doing some of those things I heard from a number of sources at Doubleday that she wasn't enthusiastic about, about the Michael Jackson piece and it the Ma Michael Jackson book. Um, and the, the thing became awkward because what he, he handed in at first was inadequate. It was just a sort of a listing of his resume of all his awards, his prizes, and you know the 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 sales of his uh, of his records. And he's a major figure in pop music, which um, is was not her thing <laughs> very much. Um, so she had to fly out to California and to meet him and to say, Michael, they're going to make fun of both of us if we don't put some more meat on these bones and uh, on these bones and you're going to have to talk about what's it like to be a black man in an all white recording industry what's it like to be um forced at a young age into this regime of performing and so 
she really had to have a tough meeting with him about that. And she flew out there to California to do it. She didn't have him come to New York. So um, she paid her dues um, in doing a book she didn't really want to do, but which um, you know, compensated for some of the books that were more small scale. Our director of collections is asking about um, a book that we feature in the upcoming exhibition, One Special Summer, and what role she might have played in that book of um, illustrations of her travel experiences. Yeah, so that's the pictures and the text from when she and Lee went to Europe, I think, before either of them were married. I don't know very much about um, the history of that um, of that book. Um, do you know when it was published? I don't know off the top of my head. That's a really great question. I'm sure Michelle, if we put her on the spot right now, <laughs> could tell us. I, you know, I remember, I remember, you know, writing, writing some stuff about that book, but I have a feeling, I have a feeling that might have come out after she died. Um, I she, thought too. she died in 94, in which case oh. it might have been Lee who was behind it. Um, it looks like it came out in 1975. Oh my God. Well then no, that's before she died. That's, that's before she went to Viking. Mm -hmm. um so um i'm just going i'm not going to make up something i don't know i do not know very much about about that book but i do know it's an authentic travel log of her and her sister going to europe before they were married well i guess we will all have to come see the exhibition beyond camelot to learn more about that one um, I was fascinated as you were talking about how many connections I could make to other first ladies and their interests as uh, you were chatting about some of the titles. Obviously, um, remember the ladies, Abigail Adams, but Martha Graham um, obviously had a big influence on Buddy Ford. Eleanor Roosevelt visited with the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, how, how much of her history as a first lady do you think impacted the choices she made in books and and her life as an editor. I think there was a, I think there was a big impact. I mean, she would never have met somebody like Stuart Udall, or you know, um, even you know, been pitched this book on the the Cold War if she hadn't been alive during the Cuban Missile Crisis and been very conscious of you know tensions between uh, the Russians and ourselves. Um, you know, I, I I think that the the White House years were um, were very important um, to her, and she was she she used a number of contacts from that period later on in her editorial career, but she was also quite young. She was in her thirties, um, and I feel like she kind of grew into something else when she was in her fifties and sixties um, during this editorial career, and really using mainly her her New York contacts for that. Uh, and one of the things we discussed before we went live on here was that great recording that you had and her voice. I mean, the sound of her voice that we know as a first lady sounds very young and breathy and is almost about, you know, c connecting to people in um, like men in an almost sexual way, I would say, versus her voice, which you described um, on the machine as being, you know, she's about work, she's an editor, she's an older woman. Um, and I love that comparison. Yeah, I, I, I did. I, I did too. I mean, I, I just, you just have the sense of it's a person who's very direct, who's um, just making a business phone call. And she sounds a little bit like a New Yorker to me. She sounds, there's something in the way that she says the digits, where to me as a Midwesterner, she feels, she sounds like a New Yorker. Well, Bill, thank you so much for joining us for um, this afternoon. Your talk was amazing. Uh, thanks for answering all these questions we had in the chat again. Um, the book is Reading Jackie. If you are looking for the titles of books that were discussed today, what, what are you working on now? What can we look forward to? 
Uh, thank you very much for asking. I'm working on Lord Byron, the English poet um, who died in 1824 and who was a great favorite of, <laughs> of Jackie's. Um, Lord Byron has has appeared in, in one of Caroline's books about her mother's fav favorite poetry. So I'm doing a biography of Lord Byron. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, it's William Kuhn and the book is Reading Jackie. And that's just kind of a sneak preview of what you have to look forward to related to the National First Ladies Library and our exhibitions and upcoming programs starting May 1st. So please connect to our website at firstladies.org or visit us in person at First Ladies National um, site. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you and have a great day. Bye everyone. Thank you yeah. for coming.